Amen, amen. Come on, you can do better than that. Hallelujah, he's worthy. I said, hallelujah, he's worthy. Quiet, sing a little bit more. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank the Lord God for he is good and he is worthy to be praised. Uh, as I went through devotion this morning, uh, I came across a little piece of text, some scripture that lightened my heart. Let me share it with you. So 1 Peter in the second chapter, starting at verse 9, says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into marvelous light. Amen. Peter is talking to some Christians, some believers who've been going through some stuff. They've been beaten up on. They've been talked about. They've been short on money. They spent some time in the doctor's office. They've been worried about how to make it. Felt like the weight of the world was on their shoulders. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Hallelujah, somebody. In, in, in spite of all of this, Peter stops to remind us that we are precious to God. Amen. That you have been selected, singled out, and set aside to receive his mercy and his grace. We're part of a winning team, and we were created to be victorious in spite of what your circumstances seem like. Amen, somebody. Come on, come on, come on now. Look, I'm thinking of something that I used to hear in church a long time ago, but I don't hear too much anymore now that God created you to be a blessing, amen? So no matter what it seemed like because of what you've been going through, God is still blessing you and expects you to be able to bless somebody else. See, he woke you up this morning and started you on your way. He brought you through this week. He, he took you from the doctor's office. He, he's provided food on your table, put clothes on your back, gave you a roof over your head. It ought to be a chance to praise him on today. In spite of what it looks like, God is still good. And you are precious to him. You might be beaten up, but you ain't beat down, all right? You might be taken up, but you ain't taken out. God is still good today and every day. Come on, give him some praise, y'all. As we rise to our feet, I know Christmas and Resurrection Sunday is a special time. We all tend to act a little more holier, don't we? But let's make a decision today that in spite of all we've been going through, let's be a blessing to somebody else 
because God is already good to us right here and right now. Amen. Come on now. Here's our mission.
wonderful name of Jesus.
Hallelujah. Bless that wonderful name of Jesus. There's power in that name. There's satisfaction in that name. There's healing in that name. There's protection in that name. Jesus. Heaven gave us. Jesus. Hallelujah. God's greatest gift to the world. Jesus. If you don't know by now, there, there is something. Oh, there's something. There's something about that name. Kings. Kingdoms. They'll all pass away. But there's something. Hallelujah. About that name. Jesus, the more you call him, I promise you, the better you'll feel. There's no other name given among men whereby we can be saved other than the name of Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Oh, how I love Jesus. You can't get into the holiday spirit. I don't care who you are without talking about Jesus. Some people like to talk about the magic of Christmas. I'm t I want to talk about the miracle of Christmas. The mercy in Christmas. The majesty of Christmas. Because it's all about Jesus. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 18 again. Luke chapter 18 again. There's somebody here love the name of Jesus. Some people only like to hear their name called. But I like calling on the name of Jesus. You appreciate 
a person when you know what they did for you. And I can stand here and I know I'm not by myself. If it had not been for Jesus, I don't know what I would do without Jesus. Luke chapter 18, I want to begin our reading at verse number 35, concluding at verse number 43. Can you pray with me? O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. There's none like you from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. We think of you for who you are. We thank you for the things that you have done. Thank you for Jesus Christ. Lord God, and as we get ready to go into your word today, it's the same old place, same old prayer. Please preside over the preaching with precision, with passion, and with power, for you know the frailty of our frames, the fragility of our forms. So we ask that you pardon us of our guilt, protect us with your goodness, provide for us with your grace, persuade us with your gospel, and pour out your gift. Let these your words be believable and receivable. May these your people be receptive as well as responsive to your holy word. Holy Spirit, this is your time to have your way. Think with my mind and speak with my mouth. You are the real preacher. Continue to convince, convict, and convert us into the conformity of Christ. Always thanking you for what you have done, yet always trusting you for what you're going to do. It's in the strong name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 18, verse 35 through 43. There you shall find these words recorded for your listening as they have been translated in the English Standard Version. But as long as you got a Holy Bible with just 66 books in it, you're doing just fine. But this is what my Bible says. As he drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. They told him Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in front of him rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him glorifying God and all the people when they saw it gave praise to God and just for a little while if you would help me today with your amens and your hallelujahs just because you love Jesus I'm going to put a tag on this text and talk on this topic recovery mode recovery mode several years ago I had the misfortune of losing all of my information that was stored on the hard drive of my desktop computer It was disappointing because there were articles that I had written, a lot of my papers from seminaries and doc notes that I had taken, and even at that time, many sermons that I had written had vanished because they were lost in what IT experts call the blue screen of death. If you ever call a help desk person and you 
you tell them that's what you see, most of the time that's just a common expression that they use. Oh, that's the blue screen of death. And what they say by that is you might as well go to the store and get yourself another computer because your hard drive has crashed. Ever since that, I no, no longer fear if a hard drive crashes again. Even from my largest device, from my desktop computer to my smallest device, my smartphone, I take the necessary steps and I even pay the money so that I can bag up all of the information just by going into recovery mode. I would strongly recommend it for somebody that's here today not to gloss over or take for granted this special feature because you just might find yourself in need of it one day. Some months ago, ran into a similar problem. But unlike the first time, all was not lost. I could simply call the help desk. They told me some keystrokes that I could use to help my device go into recovery mode. And my information, because it is saved daily, it went right back to where it was before the trouble began. Much of what we have discussed throughout uh, this gospel, we have come to understand in many cases that these individuals that Jesus is dealing with are pretty much in a recovery mode one way or another. And here it is in the language of this text. We find Jesus encountering a man by the name of Bartimaeus. His name was Bartimaeus because it means son of Timaeus. Uh, this can be cross-referenced in the peculiarities or harmonies of the other synoptic gospels in Matthew chapter 20 and verses 29 through 34 and Mark chapter 10 verses 46 through 52 because a lot of which I will say moving forward uh, juxtaposes and jumps between either of these harmonious passages. The name Timaeus means unclean, and others would describe the meaning of the name as sinful. But his father would not suffice it to live with a name like this. And when his son was born, he gave him the name that he had himself. Bartimaeus, the son of the unclean, the son of the sinful. Bartimaeus represents darkness, going from good to bad, back to good. Kind of what happened in the garden when Adam fell and all of us got the scars of sin to show it. He was in perfection. He could see, even though we read in Genesis after they ate the fruit, their eyes were open. He was not walking in darkness because he could bask in the glory and even the presence of God throughout the Garden of Eden. But when he sinned, he was messed up. And even though he 
probably didn't look like it, probably didn't feel like it. Uh, he began to die at that moment. And he needed something to help him recover. And following God's instructions, the first messianic prophecy, letting him know that the seed of a woman's going to bruise the serpent's head, yet the serpent will bruise the seed of a woman's heel. It was talking about Jesus. And, of course, we already know that would not come to pass to many, many centuries in Adam's future. But he hoped unto that until such a time when God would redeem lost man. All of us have come here in a condition whereas we are blind. Those of us who were born with 2020 vision, and even now, whatever age you are, you don't have to wear corrective eyewear like some of us do. When you were born, you were born spiritually blind. You could not see, you could not discern or process the things of God until you came to the light. And that is why one of the favorite songs of the Christian is Amazing Grace. Because it reminds us of the fact that we once were lost and now we're found. We were blind, but now we can see. It is because of our encounter with Jesus, we have recovered. You cannot recover on your own. You need Jesus. Uh, when you need spiritual recovery, you need Jesus. For a lot of people would argue, but what happens in this text is just a, another medical miracle that Jesus performed in the life of this man. But it's so much more than that. Uh, to Bartimaeus, it's so much more because it's a life-changing miracle. Think about it, brothers and sisters. If it were you, you were blind and you could not see. And all of a sudden, there was a miraculous means for you recovering your sight. How awesome that would make you feel. Uh, it would move you to always be appreciative to those responsible for you receiving your sight. Sight was something that Bartimaeus previously had. He is not like the man born blind in John's gospel chapter number nine. Even his parents vouched for him and saying, yeah, this is our son. Yes, he was born blind, but how, we, how he came up saying, we, we don't know. He's old enough. Go ask him. He can speak for himself. These fellas, it's two really. But Bartimaeus is just the spokesman of the two. He's the more vocal or outspoken one of the two. And they are in the same condition. They could see. But perhaps because of some sickness, uh, perhaps caused even by sin, they lost their sight. There were no social systems in the Bible days. When one had a disability, the only thing you could do was beg. The only thing you could do to support yourself, if you did not have family to do it for you, was to panhandle the best way that you could. Now remember, I told you he was not born blind. And even today, we know that there are schools for people who were born blind to teach them 
how to do things, how to live a life in the absence of sight, how to hone in on their other senses in the absence of vision. Uh, but such education had not been instituted or developed yet, and so one had to be often guided by the hand pointed in directions and to feel their way around the best that they could, it was really a miserable condition to be in during that time. But he came into contact with Jesus. And all of you who are born again know that when you come into contact with Jesus, he helps you to recover and to be in the condition that you really need to be in. Now, let's just talk about health for a moment because a lot of believers have some health conditions. Well, obviously, you and I, because all of us, have health conditions one way or another. Either you know about them or you don't. Amen. Amen. We want deliverance from our health conditions. Some of us will never receive that deliverance because in the wisdom and mind of God, it is just something that you can live with. I know that doesn't sound very promising, but I, why would I stand up here and lie and say, form a line? You're going to get your healing today. Put your canes and put your walkers over here. You ain't going to need them no more. And by the time this service is over, no, it just doesn't work like that. God will give us the grace to live with our little conditions. There are some times when God will uh, intervene so that he might get the glory and do us some good, but uh, between those times, uh, there are just some ailments that we can handle pretty much on our own. And such, uh, in the case of Bartimaeus, this is something that is going to glorify God as Jesus is heading back toward Jerusalem. Uh, Bartimaeus is symbolic of a, lot of a lot of the promises that have been made about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, this text, sisters and brothers, uh, not to push it, just to try my best to drop it, it's tailored to teach us that Jesus has merciful compassion in and on our miserable conditions. And the most miserable condition that we have is our sin. Uh, because sisters and brothers, like I said, there are just issues, there's just things that you can live with, take your medicine, uh, put on the prosthesis or whatever you are required to do and your sickness, sisters and brothers, will soon be managed in such a way so that you can live your life to the best of your ability. I'm, I'm, I'm going to make one small example, then I'm going to move on. What sense would it make if I try to live life, those of us wear corrective eyewear, without wearing my glasses. Now, I can see you all for the most part. I can make out that some of you are men and some of you are women. And I can make out if, you, uh, if you're kind of thin or if you're a little rotund. I can make that out, amen, I can, can make out if you got a lot of hair or little hair, the colors that you are wearing right now, but when I put the glasses on, 
the picture is so much better. And so why would I choose uh, uh, from a spiritual perspective to walk around with blurred vision? Why would I choose uh, from a spiritual perspective to walk around half blind and cannot see and make out the things that I need to make out in life uh, so life is better for me and others who share it with me? Uh, th these are the kind of symbols and these are the kinds of things that we are trying to draw out of this message about all of us uh, being, even currently, those who are saved and those who are on their way to being born again, uh, being in this recovery mode. Uh, here in the language of our text, we see uh, three particular things. The first one is an outcry for mercy. As Jesus draws near Jericho, a blind man. It was two of them. Read Mark chapter 10 and Matthew chapter 20. Uh, he sat by the roadside begging again. Uh, this is the way to get your disability income at that time. And hearing a crowd of individuals uh, go by, he's on uh, what is known as a main thoroughfare. And it was not unusual that passerbyers or pilgrims would take this road, but it must be something different about this crowd. They must be carrying on in such a way that uh, the noise that they are making, the, the, the subject of their conversation is a little different than the earlier group that traveled this way before. It was something about uh, this delegation of individuals uh, that caught his attention and he asked the question, what does it mean? Uh, what kind of crowd is this? What kind of entourage, what kind of a, 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 a motorcade, if you will, is this that these kinds of things are going on? What, what, what's the, all the buzz about? Tell me what you see. And uh, an individual responds to him and says, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Uh, after hearing this, uh, he starts to shout from the top of his lungs, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Matthew's gospel tells us that there were these two uh, that Jesus met leaving from old Jericho, passing through new Jericho, which was about a mile away. This blind beggar calls out to Jesus because he knows who Jesus is. What do you mean, preacher, he knows who Jesus is? When he is told it is Jesus of Nazareth, by this time he has heard about some of the things that Jesus has done. Perhaps he's heard about uh, he helped lame to walk. Perhaps he's heard about he cleansed the lepers. Perhaps he's heard about he's uh, stopped women from hemorrhaging uh, for many years. Perhaps he's even heard about those in the similar condition as he has. He's given sight to the blind. And so he cries out to Jesus, uh, indicating to Jesus that he clearly knows who he is. What, what do you mean, preacher? He knows who he is. Uh, that, that, that name he uses, Son of David, that is a messianic title for Jesus. You, you had to know something about your Bible. You had to know something about the promises and the, the prophecies about a coming Lord to address Jesus in such a way. And, 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 it, and it's funny to me sometimes, uh, people that are supposed to know better don't really know who Jesus is. 
is. The, the, the Pharisees never said son of David. They called him a, a wine bibber. The scribes never said son of David. They called him Beelzebub at other times. The Sadducees did not call him son of David. They, they said, is not this the carpenter's son? And over there are his brothers and sisters and his mother. They called him everything but a child of God. But this ignorant, can I call him ignorant, disabled individual is sitting by the side of the dusty Jericho Road and has the nerve to know more about Jesus than the church folk did. He does not call him teacher like uh, the rich, wrong, young ruler. Uh, he does not refer to him uh, on, on, on a first name basis. Uh, he goes all the way back uh, to the Bible where it talks about Jesus as being uh, the root and offspring of David. He says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me because he realized that only the Messiah could give him what he needed. Only the Messiah could cure blindness because there was no cure for blindness then. Much like today, there are just a handful of instances where modern medicine has corrected blindness, but there are not very many people on the world who have their sight restored or those have been born blind. Some have attempted to get eyeball transplants uh, but did not work uh, and their hopes had been dashed uh, in the process. But here it is. This man must know just enough about Jesus uh, that if he cries out for mercy, yeah. he can look for a miracle. Yeah. And that's all some of us really need to learn how to do. We need to learn how to cry out. We need to learn how to call on the name of Jesus. I was watching you just a little while ago. I was paying you more attention than you thought I was. I was paying more attention than some of you give me credit for. And both of the songs were pretty much thrusting the name of Jesus. And some of y'all ain't moved yet. Some of y'all ain't said amen yet. Some of y'all ain't lift, lift a hand, patted the feet, uh, some, not, 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 even, not even a sway or a rock. Uh, you just sat there in total silence, disbelief, and disregard because uh, it must be obvious uh, that you don't know. You, you, you are clueless to who Jesus is. We don't know his theological background, but we do know by his actions uh, that he has uh, enough sense uh, to call out uh, to the only one that can help him in his time of need. And baby, you need to put the phone down, brother. You need to put the phone down, sister, and stop calling on family members. Stop calling on friends co-workers and classmates uh, when you get in trouble and learn how to call on Jesus. What I like about this man is uh, he's transparent. Uh, he's not asking for something that he does not deserve uh, because when we ask God for grace uh, that's what we're really doing uh, God, God permits us to be selfish uh, at times uh, and to pray to him for more grace but this one is saying Lord uh, I, I've suffered this uh, as long as I can I put up with bumping into walls uh, falling down uh, into dishes uh, having to have morsels of food guided into my mouth uh, having to be taken and led by the hand. I've put up along with it as I could and if you would do anything for me just have mercy on me. My mercy is understanding that God is not really giving you what you do deserve. Okay, wait y'all, don't, 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 don't leave. Don't. We didn't get a benediction yet. We love to talk about grace, but we need to spend a little time conversing about mercy. 
That is God not giving us what we do deserve. Ah, uh, the notes say if they're not shouting by now, repeat. Uh, see, some of us are lost on the idea of mercy. If, mercy, if, if it wasn't for mercy, you would have died in your sleep last night. If it wasn't for mercy, instead of that medication that you were prescribed, just making you a little sick and then the doctor changed your dosage or the medicine altogether, if it wasn't for mercy, it probably would have killed you. Yeah. Amen, somebody. Yeah. Uh, you cussed that person out that cut you off in traffic. Yeah. But if it wasn't for mercy, it probably would have been the worst crash ever killing both of you. Thank God for mercy. But could it be, Reverend Treadwell, he likes to say that, could it be that we don't believe that we deserve any of the negative possibilities that can happen to us? Uh, uh, Karen Latine, Tarantine Agee had a song that says everything that was good that happened to me, God did. But I'd like to take that an, another a step further. Everything that was bad that God didn't let happen, that, that didn't happen to me, God did that too. Am I right, somebody? And that's because of his mercy. Jesus is passing by. What's going on here, he says. And he finds out who it is. And so he begins to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. But uh, there were those who were in front of him that rebuked him. There were those who had perhaps arrived before he did rebuked him. Maybe they considered the same thing. But from the bleachers, his shout was more prevalent than theirs from the sideline. Maybe they were jealous because they didn't think of going that far back into calling Jesus for who he really was in the manner that he did. Maybe they thought that their problem was more of a priority than his problem, because we can be like that sometimes. And so even though they hear him calling out to Jesus in this way, they try to tell him to be quiet. To be quiet. And we do that in our churches. You may not be as open and as vocal as the people in verse number 39, but the look on your face says it all. Turn around looking over your shoulder. Who is that? Making all that noise. Rolling your eyes. Holding your arms. Ain't nobody come here for all that. I mean, some people really get upset when people start praising the Lord, calling on the name of Jesus. It is worship service, isn't it? And if you got a problem with people calling on the name of Jesus in church, you're going to be miserable in heaven. That's what they're going to do all day. And all night long is called on the name of the Lord. And they tried to tell him to hush up. But he was persistent in his outcry for mercy. The more they told him to hush, the louder he got. The more they told him to stop, the more repetitive he was. He cried out all the more. The Bible says, son of David. Have mercy 
on me. When was the last time you asked God to have mercy? Don't give me what I really deserve. Because we think we deserve the best that life has to offer. We sometimes get beside ourselves. And when something good in our opinion does not happen for us, we get mad at God. I ain't going to church on the, the second Sunday because God didn't answer my prayer like I needed him to. But what about his mercy? Matter of fact, God says, y'all so silly, you ain't even got to ask for it, and I'm going to give it to you just because brand new every morning. Jeremiah tells us, by the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. Great is his faithfulness, and his compassion does not fail. Hallelujah, somebody. And if we really take an honest look within ourselves, we would learn how to appreciate God for his mercy. Him not giving us what we do deserve. He knows something about Jesus. I don't know. He might have been in synagogue that day. In Luke chapter 4, when Jesus Turn to read the scripture and he turned to the place in Isaiah that says the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. He might have been there that day. Yeah. Uh, he might have been in in Bible study, when they read from Isaiah 35 and 5, that says, the, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Yeah. We don't really know how he knows all of this about Jesus. But he puts his head knowledge in his heart knowledge, in his hand knowledge. And that's what some of us need to learn how to do. We need to have not just so much head knowledge, but we need to graduate in our relationship with God, have some heart knowledge. Because just because something in your head does not make your hands activate. But when something is in your heart, it'll get your hands moving. And so he Let's what he knows and what he feels about Jesus, he lets his uh, words live out in action. And no matter what the critics say, because you're going to always have critics. Matter of fact, Aristotle said this, uh, if you want to avoid criticism, say nothing, do nothing, and be nothing. If you don't want nobody looking down on you, if you don't want nobody throwing shade on you, if you don't want nobody trolling or criticizing you, don't say nothing. Don't do nothing. And don't try to be nothing. And people will leave you alone because you're not interesting enough to them. But here it is, this man is trying to get an upgrade in his life or at least go back to where he was. And he cries out to Jesus for mercy. Then we see an opportunity for a miracle. Now, what are you going to do after you realize you've gotten the Lord's attention? What would you really do after you finally realize you got God all to yourself? Don't tell me it won't happen. And my strivings with God. God has spoken to me. And I know it was God. Just like Job, he did all that whining. 
talking about this, that, and the third, almost started to buy into what his friends were saying. And then God finally shows up. Job, I hear you've been talking about me. He says, Job, you saying some stuff that, that's above your pay grade. It's above your security clearance, because where were you when I did this, Job? Where were you when I did that, Job? Job, he got over himself and got somewhere and sat down. And you know, Jacob had basically duped his brother out of his birthright. Knew that the brother wanted to kill him, so he hit the road. And as he was on the road, he had a wrestling match with God. Amen. And he even went on to suggest to the Lord, the angel of the Lord, I will not let you go until you bless me. And if you keep on crying out for mercy, one day you're going to have God's attention. And what will you do when you have God seemingly all to yourself? Here, this man knows if I can get his attention, it's an opportunity for a miracle. Jesus stopped. After all that, he stops and he commands the man to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. Mark chapter 10, verse 48 through 50, many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy upon, upon me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called the blind man. Cheer up, he said, they said. Get on your feet. He's calling you and throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. Now, what I like about God, he knows how to use the same people that was rebuking you five minutes ago to be utilized in the process of your deliverance or your breakthrough. Uh, come here, David. The, the, the writer of the 23rd Psalm said, like, he'll, he'll, he'll prepare a table before you in the presence of your haters and your enemies and your critics. They'll have to watch you enjoy God's uh, blessings. Uh, so they tried to stop him, but when Jesus uh, stopped, he said, call him, tell him to come here. He, he's captured his uh, attention and they said good news friend uh, uh, he's calling on you come on get up hurry up and go see what he wants and he throws his cloak aside now a blind man's cloak in the bible days is pretty much like his cane if you were leading a blind man he would hold one end of his cloak and you would hold the other and he would follow you like like a train he, he would lay it down when he would find his bag and spot. And he would pick it up. If he got cold, he, he would wrap himself in it. It was like his security blanket. And so his faith is visualized when he throws his cloak aside. It is as if he's saying, I'm not going to need this anymore. The level of dependency that he put in this cloak, he's 100% confident that when Jesus gets done with me, I'm going to come forth like pure gold. He said, oh, this is it. He said, goodbye, cloak. Hello, sight. Goodbye, blindness. Hello, vision. He jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. How he did that, being blind, we don't know. But if you can just press your way to the Lord, the best way you can, with all of you that you have, with the utmost of confidence in him, I promise you, he'll make the necessary changes in your life. But it's how you call him and then how you come to him. He doesn't do all that outcrying just to come. Oh, all right. No, he jumps up and he running to Jesus. 
grew up watching The Price is Right, then Bob Barker. They got Drew Carey now. <laughs> Some of y'all watch it just about every day. Game hasn't really changed that much. You know, it's just the way they do it. It's a little more modern these days. The people are different. There's still a gall gallery of people who register to be on the show and randomly, don't know how they do it, they select individuals from the audience. And everybody that goes to the live studio recording of The Price is Right, and it's been here in Chicago, they, they, they hope to hear their name called because if your name is called, you end up on what the show calls Contestants Row. Yeah. Contestants Row is where the action is. It's where you get to put a bid in on a, on a box of rice or or an appliance or, or, or an ATV or something like that. You, 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 get to, you get to price it, and then if you, if you beat everybody else on contestants' row, then you go on to one of the other games in the show, and possibly you can win the show and the jackpot of the grand prize. You know how the show goes. But I, in my watching it growing up, and every now and then when I'm able to, to catch it on, uh, I've never seen somebody come out of the crowd with a lackluster attitude if their name is called on contestants' row. Right. And when I think about that, sisters and brothers, uh, if that was some of us, uh, right. in, 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 the, in, in the price is right, uh, we would act a plum fool. Uh, you would jump, you would step on feet and toes, walk on chairs, run down the aisle, stand behind the podium, dancing and jumping up, howling and screaming with all the excitement. But when you come to church, you do as you just did right. 25 minutes ago. Yeah. It's how you come. You can call on him all you want to. You can call him all the right words, all the right names, but that's coming out your mouth. How you come to him is out of your heart. So he comes to him with expectation. He says, what do you want from me? Simple, Lord, let me recover my sight, indicating for us that I could see before. Something just happened along the way where I lost my sight, probably because of my own wrongdoing. Uh, but if you can do anything for me, Lord, give me my sight back. You don't know when your opportunity for a miracle might present itself. And in each Sunday when we give the invitation to discipleship, for those who don't know Jesus, when they accept Christ, do y'all know a miracle takes place? Yeah. When, when, when they receive the gospel, a, a, not, not a small one, but a major miracle takes place. Because your spiritual GPS gets recalculated. You, you, you ain't got to do nothing. You ain't got to. You ain't got to break man's laws. You, you ain't got to rob no banks. You ain't got to. You ain't, you ain't got to kill, steal, or destroy. But every soul that is born ha is routed directly to perdition, condemnation, and hell unless you get recalculated through the way, the truth, and the life uh, who is Jesus Christ. Because he's recalculated your destiny, it ought to make you excited. Because not a small, but a major miracle takes place when we trust God. So we see an outcry for mercy. We see an opportunity for a miracle. But then we see an option for marveling. Uh, beloved, let me make it simple for you. Worship and praise is not a recommendation. It is a command from God. In fact, you were created to worship and to praise God. You were created to worship and praise, and if you don't worship and praise God, because you were created to worship and to praise, you're going to worship and praise some else. 
What, some, something that you're enthusiastic about. If you're a sports enthusiast, you're going, you're going to worship and praise that. If you, you like action, if you like entertainment, you're going to worship and praise that. If, if, if you're into the men or into the ladies, you're, you're going to worship and praise that. Whatever your thing is, uh, you're going to do that and not worship and praise God. Here it is. This man is letting us know that he's all in with Jesus based on how he responds to what Jesus has done for him. And Jesus said, well, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. You've done all this hollering. You threw your cloak aside. Jesus knows the cultural norms and the customs and manners that you came running over here, bumping into people, tripping, tripping, trip, tripping, tripping on rocks and stuff. He said, your faith has made you well because immediately he recovered his sight and following him glorified God. And all the people, when they saw it, Gave God the praise. Now, some might suggest it to be a rhetorical question. I contend, however, that Jesus is requiring Bartimaeus to give evidence of his own faith. Faith, listen, is not an additive. It is an activator. See, some of us think faith is an additive. Now, faith is your activator. That is how things get done when it comes to you and the Lord. Therefore, this beggar, he didn't have the liberty to be choosy. In doing so, Bartimaeus assents to trusting in what only God in Jesus Christ can do. Give him his sight. He realizes that he must take advantage of requesting the thing that he needs the most. After receiving such, he does what any other in this position should do. It was customary for a slave or a beggar once redeemed from their privation to follow their redeemer. He is promoted from the sidelines. Now he follows Jesus. We can afford to do no less for the recovering of our sight and the redemption that we have in Jesus Christ. But there's a contrast. We've been studying this chapter for weeks now. The contrast is obvious between these two beggars and the rich young ruler. The beggars were poor, yet they became rich. While the rich young man was rich, but he became eternally poor. The beggars claimed no special merit and openly admitted their needs, saying, have mercy on us, while the young man lied about himself, all these things have I kept up from my youth. And he bragged on about his character. The young man would not believe, so he went away from Jesus very sad. But the two beggars believed in Jesus and followed him with what? Songs and praise. Songs like Mary's song. In Luke chapter 1 verse 53, he says, he hath filled the hungry with good things. And the rich he has sent away empty. Oh, the parallelism that we see right there. These two beggars, he's given them the very thing that they need to support and to take care of themselves. While earlier he has to watch one leave him sorrowful because he cannot depart himself with his many possessions. The human additions that we have read in this chapter encourage us to put our faith in Jesus Christ. And no matter what others may say or do, the window was not discouraged by the, the widow earlier in chapter 18 was not discouraged by the indifferent attitude of the judge, nor was the publican by the hypocritical attitude of the Pharisee we talked about. But the parents brought their little children, which was obvious, didn't feel the need to go into that, bring the little children to Christ, because as such is the kingdom of heaven. They were not the ones who brought them to Jesus in spite of a selfish attitude of the apostles that said, lead them 
tell them kids to go somewhere. Jesus and us, we are too important to deal with them. But the blind men came to Jesus even though the crowd told them to keep quiet. Even though the crowd told them to hush up and stay put. Jesus always responds to faith and rewards those who believe. But the rich ruler stands as a warning to all who depend on character to save them from their sins. Your self-imposed character does not, is not the deciding factor in the mercy that you receive from God. No, mercy, sisters and brothers, is a byproduct of the loving relationship that God has with us in spite of our sins. It is uh, what God gives us day by day along with grace until we know better so that we can do better. The rich young man shows us how close a person can come to salvation yet turn away in disbelief. There may be somebody hearing this message who is on the fence of decision, halt between two opinions. Uh, my advice to you and recommendation is for you to choose Jesus. Make him your Lord and Savior. Do away with your spiritual blindness by the only remedy that exists in the world. As I close, uh, there was a medical missionary successfully performing a surgery, listen, on poor blind people, restoring their sight. And now, sometimes after the operation, he had a patient that he performed this minor surgery on, and the man received his sight, but the man disappeared. Many days later, the medical missionary opened his door, and there that man was again. But the man had a rope. And as the missionary stepped to the side, he saw filed behind him dozens of blind people who were holding on to this rope, tethered to the blind man that he brought to this missionary. If Jesus has made you see, you cannot help but find spiritually blind people, the ones that are in your life, and bring them to Jesus. See, we like to bypass those we leave sleeping in the beds at home, to put on white dresses and white stockings and white gloves and go out knocking on the doors of perfect strangers. When we neglect the unchurched that we have, in our immediate circles of influence. Sisters and brothers, if amazing grace is your song of praise, if you once were lost and are now found, if you once were blind and now you see, then it ought to motivate you so that others can share in this great experience that you had with Jesus. All of us need recovery. But you got to sign up for the program. Uh, it's already been paid for. There's no monthly or annual cloud prescription. There are no unusual steps that you got to follow. All you got to do is trust in Jesus. And he will save you. He'll save you no matter who you are. Some suggest he saves from the guttermost to the uttermost. Jesus saved. He saved us on how he died on the cross. How he was buried and just like he said, if, if you destroy this temple, just give me three days. I'll raise it up again. And so it was on that third day that we call the Lord's Day, which is Sunday, 
that he got up early that Sunday morning. Not with just a little bit of power, but, but, but with all power. All power was in his hand. And because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, we have uh, the ability to stay in recovery mode. Now, it takes a little while for when you go into recovery mode for your system to come back up. But we call that the process of salvation. What I like about God is God is patient. And as long as we live, he continues to download what we need from day to day so that when we get to the stage, the final stage, that is called glorification. That means whatever Jesus is, that's what we're going to be. It means however Jesus' hands look, that's how our hands are going to look. However Jesus' feet look, that's how our feet are going to look. It's going to be a glorious day. It does not yet appear what we shall be. But the Bible says that when he appears, we shall be like him. And we shall see him as he is. Uh, and so don't think your situation is hopeless. Don't think uh, that all hope uh, is gone. If you can't live with a situation, God might be gracious uh, to make your situation leave you alone. If it's more than you can really bear. God just may do a miracle that's for your good, but most of all, for his glory. If that does happen, you ought to follow the same pattern that the man in the text follows. That he follows Jesus. That he gives God the praise. Uh, so much so that your praise ought to be contagious. Uh, you know, it bothers me. When some people don't have praise, that is contagious. Uh, what that means is uh, if you happy about God and you share that happiness with someone else, it ought to make that other person start talking about the great things God has done for them. I love when I see a praise party. All it takes is a handful of people that don't mind telling that I've seen the lightning flash, that I've heard the thunder roar, that I felt sin breakers dashing against me, trying to conquer my soul. But I heard mm -hmm, the voice of Jesus telling me to still fight on. He gave me a promise, y'all, never to leave me alone. And I've been trusting in him ever since. Had some good days and some bad days. But I'll tell you the truth this morning. That all of my good days, they still outweigh my bad days. I ain't got time to complain. Why? Because God has been good to me. Do I have a witness? Uh, if I start talking about how good he's been to me, all I need you to do is to talk about how good he's been to you. God has been good to me. He's been so good to me. Better than this whole world could ever be. He dried uh, all of my tears away. Turned my darkness in the day. Uh, so I'm going to stand here today uh, and bother complaining. Because uh, God has been good. Uh, I'm living today uh, in recovery mode. Uh, Every day uh, he's pouring into me. Uh, I'm growing uh, 
from faith to faith uh, and grace to grace uh, I'm growing uh, by leaps and bounds uh, because I trust uh, in Jesus uh, how about you uh, I've held you long enough uh, if you're in recovery mode uh, encourage your neighbor tell your neighbor uh, hold on stay connected uh, cause when I look at my device uh, it says do not disconnect from the power source uh, do not disconnect from the internet uh, or oh, your recovery uh, is going to fail uh, I know you get tired uh, I know you get weak uh, but don't give up on God uh, and God uh, won't give up on you uh, stay connected and keep your hand uh, in the master's hand uh, and he will he will uh, deliver you uh, I know he will uh, bring you out uh, do I have a witness uh, bye bye y'all uh, but I got a few questions uh, have you any rivers uh, that you think uh, uncrossable uh, have you uh, any mountains uh, that you can't uh, tunnel through uh, God uh, specializes uh, in things uh, that seem uh, impossible uh, and he'll do what no other power Holy Ghost power uh, is able to do uh, one more question uh, have you uh, any diseases uh, that the doctors uh, say are incurable and those doctors uh, said they've done uh, all uh, that they can do uh, God uh, specializes uh, yes sir uh, in things uh, that seem uh, impossible uh, do I have a witness uh, find somebody uh, and tell them uh, he will uh, he will do uh, what no other power is able to do uh, uh, that's why I encourage you every time I get uh, to be not dismayed uh, whatever be tied uh, God 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 uh, he will he will uh, take care of you uh, if you know he will uh, say yeah say yeah yes he will uh, he'll take care of you Are you in recovery mode? It begins when you trust Jesus for salvation. Remaining and staying connected to God. And day by day, he imparts and outpours. Some things will happen immediately, other things will take place gradually. Like the man's sight, it happened immediately. The purpose of that was to authenticate Jesus Christ in the world, his greatness and his glory. And the man followed him, praising and glorifying God. And your worship and your praise, it, it ought to be infectious, it ought to be communal, it ought to be contagious. Hallelujah, somebody.
But if you're not in recovery mode, we ask you today, we entreat you to seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way, the Bible says, and the unrighteous his thoughts, and let him turn unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon you. Can I see the hands, please? Those who are saved and know that you're saved. Thank you so much. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I told you I can't see that good just in case I may miss somebody. This invitation is for you if you are unable to raise your hand. We want you to be able to raise your hand next time should you be presented with this question. We want you to be in a recovery mode. First step, justification. God giving you a status just as if you never sinned. I ain't going to get to all this. Lots of steps. I ain't going to get into all of them. But the final step is glorification. And that is when he comes, you will be like him. That thing that I said earlier that you just got to live with, you won't have to live with it up there. That was just meant for down here. That was meant to keep you trusting in God. But over there, Hallelujah. They said this yesterday at the Godfather's funeral. Soon as my feet strike Zion, I'm going to lay down my heavy burden. When I get up there, I'm going to tell the story how I made it over. And in telling that story, there's that name again. Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. And there's somebody here today that needs Jesus. You need mercy. You need a miracle. And you need to marvel. Every day, I thank God. I, I, I'm, I'm not lost on the gift of salvation. Election into the family of believers. I'm looking forward to the day where all I got to do is come out here and say election. And everybody lose their mind. I just said election and somebody just thought about something else. Some people just looking at me like, okay, what are you talking about now? I'm looking for the day when I just come out here and say election and people just pass out. Because they understand what it really means. Hallelujah. And there's somebody here today. If not, if you're here, come on. If you're here, come on. If you're here, come on. If not, if not, hallelujah. On your way to your seat, give God some praise. Hallelujah. Bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Oh, there looks like there's one who's coming. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah.